Senate and member of the Intelligence Committee. Congressman, thanks for being back on the show, especially today. Yeah. You were just a couple of blocks away when the 9-11 attacks happened. Talk through your memories of that day and what it means to you to be sitting here 18 years later. Yeah, it is obviously a very somber day for somebody who uh, represents, as I do, uh, family after family uh, that lost fathers and mothers and children. Uh, pretty much everybody in my district knows someone who was lost that day. We're just to the north of New York, and yes, I happened to be there. And uh, you know, I remember the horror. I remember the fear. Uh, I walked around what was then the smoking pile after the collapse, thinking, you know, this was friends and family, and, and of course firefighters and policemen who had been killed there. Um, what I never forget, though, is what I saw next uh, as I sort of made my way north in Manhattan, which was New Yorkers, pretty tough crew, uh, lining up everywhere to give blood, uh, bringing bottles of water to firefighters, uh, get home, and of course in Connecticut, uh, um, it's seared into my memory, those cars in the parking lots, I've got a lot of commuters, those cars in the parking lots that sat in the parking lot for days, and yet neighbors coming together, bringing food, consoling each other. It was really as horrible as the moment was. It was an amazing American moment of feeling like we were one family. And a feeling of resiliency uh, after the attacks yeah. as well. I know you just came this morning from a briefing here at the Capitol on Afghanistan. And I want to ask you about that. Are we, what did you learn new from that, first of all? Anything? Well, um, you know, it's been a dramatic week in that regard, yeah. right? Uh, I'm, president Trump alluded to it himself in yeah. a speech there at the Pentagon. And, and, and look, I fully support the president uh, negotiating with the Taliban to try to finally get the last troops out of what is America's longest war, uh, bringing the Taliban to the kind of stage set that is Camp David or the White House or Washington, D.C. These are murderers. These are people who want us living in the ninth century. I never thought that was a good idea. Uh, what concerns me is, and let's remember, uh, our young men and women in uniform and our intelligence community accomplished a miracle. Uh, the Taliban was gone, mm. uh, and uh, al-Qaeda wiped out in Afghanistan. Well, here we are, more, almost two decades later, uh, and while we accomplished that mission, we were not able to rebuild Afghanistan into some sort of functioning place. So the question is, what do we do now? And um, that was the subject of today's meeting. Do you think that we are, as a nation, better equipped to fight terror, specifically homegrown terror, from this country? Uh, no question. And in fact, it's interesting that you ask the question that way, because on the Intelligence Committee, of course, I focus on the remarkable efforts that we make abroad, uh, uh, taking out terrorists, uh, listening to terrorists, watching terrorists. And, you know, we haven't suffered an attack anywhere near of the magnitude of 9-11, and that's a credit to our military and to our intelligence community. You said homegrown. Um, we're seeing an uptick in that. Uh, that seems to be what is killing America's, Americans today. And of course, that's a totally different problem. That's not about, you know, Al Qaeda networks. That's about radicalization here at home. It's about white supremacists. Um, and, and that's a wholly different ballgame. But that seems to be what's killing Americans today. You talked about your agreement with the president that, yes, negotiations with the Taliban should move forward. There was disagreement, as you know, inside the president's own administration on how those talks should happen that, based on our reporting, led to the firing of his national security advisor, John Bolton, the dismissal of Ambassador Bolton. Your reaction to that? Well, I think the dismissal of Ambassador Bol Bolton actually probably makes for a higher probability um, that we get a reasonable solution in Afghanistan. Look, Bolton's uh, uh, solution for everything was to send in the troops. And you just, you know, you can talk to anybody in the military, anybody who knows this stuff, and they will tell you there's no military solution in Afghanistan. We're not going to militarily beat the Taliban with the 14,000 troops that we have there today. We didn't do it with the 150,000 troops we used to have there. Now, we have a problem, right? The president has said, I will keep negotiating or maybe we'll leave just without a deal. Now, if you're the Taliban and you're listening to that, you say, I'll take option two, yeah, the leave one. without a deal. So the president, and again, I do support him negotiating, but he basically gave away our negotiating leverage. And he says we're hitting them harder than ever before. Look, we've got 14,000 people there. That's less than 10% of what we used to have. So we just don't have a lot of leverage on the ground in a very difficult place. We talk about the national security apparatus inside the administration. Uh, as the ambassador was being dismissed, Ambassador Bolton, another former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, was appearing in federal court here in Washington. You on the House Intelligence Committee and your colleagues want to see Michael Flynn. You want documents from him. He has apparently not been cooperative. Can you share an update on the status of those discussions? Do you expect that he might have a change of heart here or has that been ruled out? Well, hard to say. I mean, part of the reason that he wouldn't come before the Intelligence Committee was that he was obviously being tried and he was in the judicial system. That is obviously coming to a close uh, when, he is, when he is sentenced. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's an interesting question. Our interest in that 
that, um, you know, he had a conversation uh, with the Russian ambassador and then he lied about that conversation, which is what he's in trouble for with the law. Um, and we'd like to know more about that. You know, what else was said? Uh, you know, why did he lie? Why did he feel obligated to not tell the truth to FBI agents, which gets you sent to jail? We would like to know more about Sounds that. Sounds like he and his lawyer have not been forthcoming on those kinds of things with you. Yeah, you yeah. I mean, change. there's a, you know, again, there are people who simply say, no, we're not going to come talk to you, uh, that you don't get to say that to the United States Congress. And then there are people who have been caught up in trials in the judicial system who have said, hey, we got to get this done yeah. before that. So we'll we'll see what approach Flynn takes. Congress